Okay, everybody, the day has come that everyone has been looking forward to in research methods, and that is when we're going to do statistics. Yay. Okay, I don't know if you guys can read the cartoon. I don't know that it came out as clearly as I want, but if you're familiar with Dilbert, he's this great little business guy, and he says, I didn't have any accurate numbers, so I just made this one up. Studies have shown that accurate numbers aren't any more useful than the ones you make up. How many studies showed that? 87. <laughs> yeah, and that's a perfect example of what can happen in statistics. When we don't do statistics correctly, when we don't understand them, when we don't know what we're looking like, then we can end up making things up and making claims, which is actually the bigger part of that that's the problem. We can end up making claims that aren't true and that can actually really have long-lasting and reaching effects. So. Okay, the first thing we're going to talk about, statistics can be divided into descriptive and inferential, and so we're just going to talk about descriptive statistics today, just to kind of lay a really good foundation for everybody. So, what are statistics and why do I need to know this? And I've actually kind of already given you the answer to that. Statistics are basically just a set of rules and operations that we follow to help us organize and understand the data that we have uh, collected in our, in our experiments. And you all have been doing your experiments in here. And we haven't done uh, the actual statistics on it. Some of you have had stats at this point, some of you haven't. Um, but basically, yeah, it's just, it's just what we do to make sure we understand our data and then we can communicate that to the outside world. What we could do uh, is we could just take our raw data, you know, we run a poll, do 100 people, hand that out to people, here you go, this is what I found. Well, that's not a very effective way of communicating. And there's a lot better ways that we can do that. So with descriptive statistics, basically what it is is we are describing our data. We're looking at it. We're seeing what characteristics it has. Uh, we're seeing what happens most frequently. Um, we can also show relationships between variables. So the example that we're going to use throughout this lecture is going to look at uh, social media and how, many, how much time students spend on social media, which myself, we all spend time on social media. And so if we were going to show a relationship in our statistics, we might want to know what happens when people spend a lot of time on social media and then what happens with their grades. And so that would be, statistics could help us show a relationship between those two things. If people spend a lot of time on social media, do their grades go up or do their grades go down? And statistics helps us uh, explain things like that. So what's the purpose of our descriptive statistics? Well, basically we want to understand our data. We just don't want to look at a bunch of raw numbers. We, that doesn't really tell us very much. And we want to be able to know what, what is that telling us? What is it telling us about our population that we're studying? What is that telling us about this phenomenon, maybe depression or anxiety? Uh, our statistics help us kind of interpret that information and be able to understand it. And then be able to uniformly share that with other people. Now, inferential statistics, which will be the next chapter that we get into, we won't really get into that today, it does all the things that descriptive statistics does, but it really then goes a step further. And it says, okay, well, this is our you know, data, this is what it looks like, this is what we know about it, this is the relationship between variables. Well, now we want to infer that. We want to take that from our study and we want to apply it to the larger population to see what we find out. And so if we were doing a study, again, on social media and studying, so we might find that there's a relationship, but what we really want to find out is can that then apply to the larger population? Can we take these 20 people or 50 people in our study, do the statistics, can we then apply that to a larger population and what, and what can we find out about that process and, and why students, um, you know, why the social media makes a difference, you know, with their grades. So, so statistics, why do you need to know that? Well, because that is what's going to help us really truly understand what's going on in some of our phenomenons. Uh, can anybody think of an example that you have read of where statistics um, kind of went wrong or where a study, how a study was done sort of went wrong and we found out something different, we proved something that really wasn't proven. Can anybody think of it, an example like multitasking. that? Multitasking. Multitasking. Okay, John, and what about multitasking? How does that fit? At first, they was saying that multitasking is great, you know, um, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, you'll be able to accomplish a lot. But now, new studies or the different statistics show that it's not the greatest thing for us to do and focus on one thing and get it done. Okay. Yeah, it's a great example. Another example I was thinking of was the whole uh, vaccination um, thing that's happened. And, that, and that's, that's a situation where someone ran a study and found some results and those results, and, and I don't know all the ins and outs of exactly was it the statistics or was it the process. I think it was a little bit of everything. And actually what we found out was now we have people who don't vaccinate their children based on misinformation, based on a study that was flawed. And so why do we study statistics? For those of you who are going to go on and do research, like Alfred, who are going to go on and teach this, really important you know this. Make sure you can communicate it. But for other students in our class who I know are going to be clinicians, you're going to go into therapy, 
you need to know how our study is done. What do these statistics show? Because you're going to then advise clients, you're going to advise parents, you know, to do certain things or to follow certain treatments. Um, and if you're basing that on flawed information, then that's not good for everyone involved. So, so that's just a little quick background. So let's get into uh, some specifics about descriptive statistics. Okay. Measures of central tendency. Probably the most important thing you're going to do in statistics, and really the foundational thing that we want to find out, is we want to find out what our measure of central tendency is. Well, what is that? That's such a big fancy word. Basically, you're looking for the average. We're looking at our data and we're saying, okay, I've, I've done this study, I've got all these numbers, what piece of information, which score here is most representative of my data? When I look at this, what's the average, what's the most typical thing that's happened here? And so an example of that would be your GPA. So your GPA, say you've got a 3.5 and a 4.0 scale. Well, that tells us a couple of things. It tells us that on average, out of all the classes that you've taken, you've gotten a 3.5. It's pretty good, okay. It also tells us that you're typically your grades that you're earning are typically going to be A's and you probably have a few B's thrown in there. We know you're not a C or D student because that would be a 1.5, 2.0 average. So, it tells us some things about who you are and about, your, about yourself as a student. So as we go through, there's a couple different, uh, three different measures of central tendency we're going to look at, and all of them are useful for different variables, depending on the variable that you're dealing with. So we did variables way back in like chapter one or two, and that's been a little while. I know you all have slept since then. So we're just going to do a real quick little review of that. So we have four different variable types. Nominal, this is your categorical. Uh, variables. This is where you are male or you are female um, for your political party, you're a Democrat, you're a Republican. So the variable describes what category you fit into. Ordinal, this is going to be a rank order. We find this with letter grades. A, B, C, D, E, not E, F. <laughs> Somehow we skip the E in there. Um, and then or social class. We have low class, we have middle class, we have high class or, or upper class. Um, and so it's just a way of rank ordering things. Uh, the intervals, your interval and your ratio are where you're going to be dealing with actual, uh, like a numerical value. And so with intervals, it's your rank order that has equal distance between it, such as temperature, 5 degrees, 10 degrees, 15 degrees. Um, IQ scores, you can put those in an order and there's a point difference between them. And then ratio just goes beyond the interval just a little bit and says you have an absolute zero point. So uh, with absolute zero, you can have no income um, and you can't have no temperature. So that's the difference there. You don't have zero temperature. Zero temperature doesn't mean there's no temperature. It just, it's just a, a, a point on the line. Uh, but whereas with income, you can have an absolute zero. Somebody could have, have a job and they would have zero income. So I just want to give you guys a real quick little review of that just so you know what we're talking about as we go into this. So, Okay, the mean. The mean is the most basic. It's the most frequently used um, measure of central tendency. Basically, it's just an average. So. Uh, it's your mathematical average of all your scores. And the reason I put the M and the M in there is that uh, as you guys have been reading your articles throughout this semester, uh, throughout this class, you've seen that designation. And so why sometimes is it uppercase and why sometimes is it lowercase? Well, uppercase means you're talking about a population, which is your whole group, um, such as we could be talking about all the students at Avila. And when you use lowercase m, that's actually talking about the mean or the average of a sample from your population. So if we were using the mean of just a sample of Avila students, we might be sampling just this class. So when you look at that and you read that in a report, I want you guys to be able to read that and know, oh, okay, I'm talking about a population. Oh, they're talking about a sample. Like I said, it's the most frequently used measure of central tendency. We do use all the data in our data set, and you're going to see that if we did a, if we did a study and we had 50 scores, we would use all those 50 scores to arrive at our average. And that's not always true for median and for mode. And it is, out of all the different types we're going to talk about, it is the most stable and it's most reliable overall. Now, there are some exceptions to that, and we will get into that here just a little bit. Okay, so let's go back to our hours spent daily on social media. So this is freshmen and this is seniors. and so. In, in my hypothetical world, I probably think freshmen are spending more time on social media. Uh, by the time people reach senior status, hopefully you've kind of figured out you can't spend all your time on Facebook and Snapchatting and Instagram. So this is our data. So we had 10 students, we had 10 freshmen and 10 seniors. We asked them how many hours they spend. Some of them spend six hours, some freshmen spend four, three, varying amounts. Some of the seniors, some spent two, some spent four hours. 
Hey, see number five, zero time on social media. Now, I don't even know if I believe that, but that's what they said. So we included them in our study. All right, so um, make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. So formula for calculating the mean. Now, I know some of you, like Alfred in my class, are math whizzes, and you're going to get this right off the bat, but I've had to work a little bit harder for my math skills. So I don't want to assume anything here. So this is our formula for when we calculate a mean. And basically all we're doing is calculating an average. So again, when you see the large case M, that means we're dealing with population, population exactly, not a sample. That's our mean. And then our little fancy uh, Latin symbol here just means sum. X stands for our variable. In this case, our variable is number of hours we spend on social media. And N is our number of participants or subjects. And you'll see that also in all the studies that we're reading. You'll see that N, and it tells you how many people participated. So very quickly, I just took all of our freshman scores. We add those up. We divide it by 10. That's how many participants we had. 42 over 10, voila, 4.2. So now we have our mean. That's the mean for our social media uh, for freshmen. OK. So then if I calculated for the seniors, I did that ahead of time for your benefit, and we see that it is 1.8. So pretty big difference. So that tells us a little something. It tells us a little something about our freshmen are spending, at least in this study, more time on social media, and our seniors are spending a little bit of less time. So, um, and the mean will be really important as we consider uh, distribution of variability as we go into the next section. Um, we'll know that that's a really important way of, of seeing how our scores are distributed and seeing whether they all cluster together or we see them kind of really spread out, and that tells us something about um, our results. So, now, can anybody think of any problems that you might have? Like right here, we have all sorts of little numbers that are close together. Um, what would happen if, say, our senior who spent zero hours, he fesses up, and lo and behold, he actually is spending 18 hours a day on social media. That's all he's doing. What does that do to our numbers, you think? It makes the mean higher. It makes the mean higher, exactly. And that's, and that's exactly the problem that happens with the mean sometimes. In this case, all of our scores are clumped together. That, that's pretty good, and that gives us a pretty accurate mean. But however, if that was 18, so um, yeah, so it's not appropriate when you have an outlier. So in that case, we had 18. So we took the 18, which was the average, and we put another 18 in, and that was 36. And we divided that by 10. We came up with 3.6. Well, without the outlier, is 1.8. So all of a sudden, we have a very different mean. And so you have to think about your outlying scores. Or it could be that you had scores that were really high, and now all of a sudden, you had somebody with a super low score. And it's going to do the same thing. It's going to drag your mean down. OK. Um, we only use it typically with interval and ratio variables. Of course, that's pretty easy to understand why. Nominal variable like a Democrat, we can't calculate an average Democrat. We might be able to describe them, but not numerically and not mathematically. Okay, median. This is another way of expressing measure of central tendency. We tend to use that with interval and ratio again because we're looking at numbers. But sometimes with ordinal values, there's some debate uh, in, the, in the literature that I have about whether or not you can do that. Uh, but basically our median is just going to be the center of any group of ordered variables. So our example here, we have one, two, three, four, five. What's our middle number? Three. It sits right smack in the middle. We have 50% scores lower, 50% scores higher. Um, and so three is our center number. Now in this case, where the median, I mean the mean used all of the scores, with the median you only use some of your scores. And that's how we can see that. We only are looking at these scores right, this score right here. So again, let's look at back to our example of our social media. So if you look at that, which one do you think is the median? Just looking at it. The tendency that people are going to have to do, and this is kind of one of those little cognitive tricks, is they want to just go to the middle one. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's it. No, the difference is you have to rank order them. So if we're going to rank order this, we've got what? We've got a three with the freshmen. We've got a four. We've got another four. We've got a couple of fours. We've got one, two, three, fives. Um, we've got two sixes. Okay. Well, this is 10 numbers. So how do you find the middle of 10? And that's what we're going to do now. <laughs> Say this was only 9. Say we only had 9 participants. Well, we'd go to the middle one. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3. OK. So 4 is our middle, all right? 
Well, we can still find the median though with an even number. What we're simply going to do is you're going to take your two middle numbers. Okay? So, and I know this is very elementary for some of you, but for some of you this is really going to help you get a lay a foundation of how we do averages, which is real important. So, okay. Well, and 10 numbers, you've actually got two that are in your middle, okay? So when you have an even number, four plus five is what? Nine, we're gonna divide that by two, and that's how we arrive at our median. So we can still do a median, but again, the important thing is when you're looking at your data is you've got to make sure you've got it ordered in rank order and not just look at a screen like that and go, oh, well number five is the middle one and pull that out, so. Okay. Everybody got that? Yeah. All right. I think I became a teacher probably because I wanted to write on the board. <laughs> I enjoy that. Okay. Uh, make sure... Okay. All right. So again, just wrote out for you what we just did. Odd number of values, medians right in the middle. If you've got an even number of values, you take your two centermost, you uh, add and then divide them. Now the advantage of the median is not affected by extreme scores. So like your mean where your high number can pull it down, your low number can pull it up, it doesn't happen with the median. So we see here with this example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, what's the middle number? 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 99, what's the middle number? 3. So 3 remains the median value. Now, because you're very smart students, I know this about you, you're probably thinking, well, what's the difference? I mean, still 99 isn't very representative of that. I mean, like, you've got all these no low numbers. So, so that is something that you have to consider. But you will have situations where having an extreme score like that may not make any difference. It doesn't necessarily affect your data and what you're trying to find out. An example of that would be uh, if, you were running a, if you were doing an experiment with a rat. You wanted your rat to run a maze, okay? So you've got this cute little white rat, and he runs the maze. And the first, you know, he runs it in two seconds. He runs it in 2.5. He runs it in 2.8. He's really speedy one day. He runs it in 1.8, and then he runs it in 20 seconds. Okay. So if we ranked order that, we would go one, two. Well, 2.5 is our middle. All right. So that's still our median. So perhaps the day he took 20 seconds, he was wandering around. He thought he'd check out, you know, the glass, he just, you know, whatever reason. So, but we still know some things about our rat. We still know that he's learned to run the maze, and we still have an idea of what he can do. So, in this particular case, you don't necessarily are not worried about finding an average speed. So having an outlier like that won't make a difference in your results. Okay. All right. So that's median. And then there's one more that we're going to look at, and that's your mode. And I'm going to suspect that some of you probably have never even heard of the mode. Uh, it's the most basic, it's not the most, it is, it is a basic, it's very uncomplicated way of finding your median. It's also very uncommon. Basically all the mode is telling us is what has occurred most frequently. So if we pulled everybody in our class of what, there's 20 of you here, um, and we asked what kind of flavor ice cream you liked, 15 of you raise your hand to chocolate, Four likes strawberry, one likes vanilla. Well, the mode is chocolate because that's the one that the most people liked. So it's just what, what happened the most in your study? What did you find the most? And so uh, unlike median and mode, mode, mean uses all of your data, median uses just a little bit, and then mode uses even less. It just is looking at your frequency. And so let's go back to our little uh, social media. What's our mode then for freshmen? Which one occurs the most? Four. Yeah, four. number four. Right. So four, four different people had four said four. Okay, and then for your seniors. One, two, four, two. 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 Right. Two. I, I try to make this as easy as possible for <laughs> everybody. Yeah. And for myself. <laughs> so, right. So, in this case, fours are most frequently occurring and twos are most frequently occurring. Okay. Now, the thing about the mode is, is that it can be bimodal. Not everything in statistics or in life works out perfectly and even like we would like. So, uh, in the case of the ice cream, we could have had 10 students who like chocolate and we could have 10 students who like strawberry. Well, that's sort of the problem with the mode. Then it's like, well, we still don't have the most representative because we have two things that equally occurred. 
so it's unreliable in determining central tendency, as you can see from that example. We can use it, though, to describe nominal data. So we can say, uh, you know, Democrat or Republican, which do we have more of? And so, for example, again, using Avila, say there's a thousand of us at Avila, students, faculty, and staff, and so we did some political polling. Lo and behold, there are more Democrats at Avila, okay? Well, what does that really tell you? It just tells you there's more Democrats at Avila. It doesn't give us any kind of real numbers to work with. So, in that situation, what you would actually want to do is figure out a percentage. So we would be polling Avila, we would say, we have a thousand people, oh, lo and behold, 600 of them turn out to be Democrats. Now we've got a real number to work with. We know that 60% of Avila uh, identifies themselves with the Democratic political party. So that's actually, so with mode, you're actually sometimes even going to want to get a real number because that's actually better to work with and it's just, it tells you more about what you're working with. Now, it does have the advantage of describing large amounts of data. Uh, this was my bakery cupcake idea because I just love cupcakes, but it goes back to what we are saying about the ice cream. If you're a baker and you wanted to, um, you know, order, you want to know what I want to order. I'm selling all these cupcakes, I'm selling a thousand a week, and I want to make sure I keep that up. I want to know what I'm selling the most of. Well, you may not necessarily care the average of what you sell in a day or what you you know, sell on a Saturday, but you want to know what's flying off your shelves. And so mode would be a good way to do that. So you'd want to go, oh, wow, it looks like everybody really loves, you know, our German chocolate cupcakes, and so we're going to order more of those. So that's just a real-world, non-mathematical example of how that works. So real quick then, guys, central tendency, interval and ratio variables, typically you're going to use the mean because it's the most appropriate, unless you've got those outliers. Nominal data, you're going to find the mode. Why? Well, because with political parties, we don't have an average, so we have to describe that uh, average differently, or we have to describe that data differently. The mode can be used with all the variables to tell frequency, but it may not be significant. Again, we might know that more people at Avila are Democrats, but that doesn't really tell us anything if we don't know anything about how many people there were to begin with. And then ordinal data, which is our, which are, uh, the rank order data that we use, we can use the median. People say you can calculate the mean on that, but it tends to not necessarily be reliable, particularly with things like social class. How do we find an average social class? We have low, we have middle, and we have high. So anyway, so that's your review of central tendency, all about finding the average. Again, like I said, make sure you kind of get those concepts down, review them, ask any questions you need to, because the next section we're going to go into uh, variabilities, looking at standard deviations, and we're going to do all of that based on primarily the mean, and so make sure you understand that. Okay.